asked a number of times about Johnson Group, and uh, we do have a station at the back there, but basically this, this is a Winnipeg-based uh, organization that uh, is in the employee benefits area and has actually grown to more than $575 million in uh, premiums under administration. Uh, we've, we're now at 250 employees in our new office uh, on King Edward Street, and, and Lauren has actually been over, and uh, and all you guys should come to to come and, and check it out sometime. We'd love to, we'd love to show you around. Um, I want to just, from a group insurance perspective, certainly we've seen a ton of curiosity around this topic. Uh, that's why you're all here today, and whatever stage you're at in in kind of your uh, level of knowledge around cannabis, we hope that we can, you know, with this panel and with, with the others that you've seen, kind of increase that uh, knowledge and position you for success. Uh, so what I want to do now is just introduce uh, some of the, the people on the panel that we have, and it's it's a great group. Um, first of all, I wanted to introduce, and we'll hold our applause to the end, uh, but um, they're going to come join me up on the couch here. I'm going to follow uh, the lead from this morning and stand at the pulpit rather than rather than sit there. But uh, first of all, John Arbuthnot. So John is CEO at Delta 9 Cannabis. He co-founded Delta 9 in 2012 and is responsible for managing activities under its licenses and regulatory compliance. Previously served as CEO and director of SVT Capital Corp. So why don't you come on up here, John, we'll have a seat. Uh, Jamie Jersak. She is the uh, lawyer at Taylor McCaffrey. She focuses on occupational health and safety. She's well versed in assessing clients in, respo in responding to serious workplace accidents, defending employers charged under health and safety legislation. Come on up, Jamie. Matt Godry is director of product support and management at Great West Life Insurance Company. With 10 years experience in group life and health, he spent most of that time in the prescription drug space. He currently oversees maintenance, support, and product development for Great West. Finally, we have Mark Rolnick. Mark is the Vice President of Employer Health Solutions at Shoppers Drug Mart. Shoppers was part of launching the first medical cannabis program in Canada. Mark has a Bachelor of Science from the U of M, Bachelor of Science from U of T, and an MBA from York. So please join me in welcoming the panel this afternoon. Okay, so we've had uh, a lot of good discussion already today, but uh, I wanted to actually start with, with you, John, if I could. Uh, as CEO of Delta 9, you've had quite a, quite a month. You know, you've, um, uh, you started off, you know, you've been doing the whole medical cannabis stream for some time now, but now with the transition over to recreational, if you could just talk to us a little bit about um, how those products are different. I know we heard from uh, Pat this morning that he said there is no difference in the products, but perhaps you could talk from a Delta 9 standpoint. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Adam, and thank you to the, uh, the Johnson Group, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for uh, putting on the event uh, for all of us today. Uh, to, to get into your first question, in regards to differences between medical and, and recreational cannabis, I, I think the first uh, differentiation that we need to draw here is, is really between illegal or illicit cannabis and legal. Uh, because, of course, we, we have a structured framework here in Canada for uh, production, for distribution, for sale of medical and recreational uh, products. And that's entirely in the, in the licit framework. Uh, but we also have a very entrenched black market. Uh, so first of all, what's the difference between black market and, and legal market? Uh, well, of course, on the legal market side, we have a system of Health Canada regulated producers uh, and distributors uh, who are selling product either directly to medical consumers uh, or uh, they are selling product to provincial uh, distributors or provincially regulated retailers. And uh, every province has a little bit different take on what the recreational distribution framework looks like. Uh, on the black market side, uh, obviously we have the conventional black market around uh, grow ups and, and distributors and dealers. Uh, we also have on the medical and recreational side uh, a system of dispensaries that are, are illegal uh, as well as online sales uh, of cannabis that has become quite common over the last number of years, uh, also technically in the illegal uh, spectrum. Uh, now, Delta 9, uh, very early on as a Health Canada licensed producer, uh, conducted testing uh, of black market products seized from dispensaries, uh, seized from dealers, seized from grow ops by City of Winnipeg Police. 
And what we found was products seized from the black market uh, were very often not meeting uh, the required standards as set forth by Health Canada for things like cleanliness, uh, absence of mold, mildew, bacteria, uh, as well as some of the more harmful elements, human pathogens, uh, e. coli obviously present in the news uh, uh, very recently, but heavy metals, pesticide residues, things like that. So th there's very certainly a difference between the products that we're seeing from the black market uh, and products that we're seeing from the Health Canada uh, regulated and, and the legal market. Uh, now in terms of the differences between then on the, on the legal market side, uh, between medical and recreational, this is where it actually, and, and similar to one of the panelists this morning, uh, becomes quite similar. Uh, you'll see a lot of the Health Canada licensed producers are participating in medical and recreational markets. Uh, many producers will run production lines that are, are actually overlapping in terms of the product for medical and recreational is uh, functionally the same. Uh, it's really at the packaging stage where we're packaging, labeling, and branding that product where, where you'll see some differentiation between medical and recreational. But from a quality assurance and testing standpoint, uh, these products from medical and recreational are, are functionally the same. Uh, I think the big, uh, or the last point I'll touch on here is, is uh, over the last number of years, and as we've seen Health Canada commercialize a medical framework uh, for, for medical cannabis products here in Canada, uh, we, we've really seen a growing acceptance from the medical community. Uh, we've seen, I, I think, medical cannabis become, for lack of a better term, much more medical. Uh, we're seeing uh, kind of a shift away from the dried flour, from the smokable products, uh, to the ingestible oils, to gel caps, to more conventional drug delivery methods that your, your healthcare practitioner, your pharmacist are a little bit more used to. And over the coming years, uh, we will continue to see this shift uh, towards uh, Again, call it more conventional drug delivery mechanisms. We'll see introduction of, of pharmacies like Shoppers Drug Mart, uh, PharmaSave, Delta 9's pharmacy partner uh, into the distribution network. Uh, so medical cannabis becoming more medical, uh, but from a, a product quality standpoint uh, and from the Health Canada regulated producers, very much an emphasis on product quality. Thanks a lot, John. So uh, one of the things we heard in, in many of the earlier sessions was talking about uh, developing a workplace policy. Uh, fortunately, Jamie, who's here with us today, has written many of these. Um, so, Jamie, give us the give us the quick um, wins that we would have. Like, if, if we're drafting this policy, or if you're going to draft it for us, uh, tell us a little bit about what should uh, what should be in there. Sure thing. So, when um, putting a policy together for your workplace, first of all, have one. Uh, so, <laughs> that's that's key number one. Uh, my biggest caution with respect to policies is don't just pull one off the shelf and assume all workplaces are created equal because they're not. And what might work for one workplace may or may not work for yours. And take a careful look at your own workplace and develop something that's going to reflect your workplace and your culture. Not just with respect to cannabis, but with respect to any drug and alcohol use. So with, with that said, key things that I see or I look for when I'm either reviewing a policy or drafting one is first of all, how do you define drugs and alcohol? I can't tell you how many policies I've looked at that say that otherwise would be a fine policy for your workplace, but it says we prohibit alcohol and illegal drugs, which is great until the 17th of October, um, because now we have a legal drug that your policy has not excluded. Also, by saying we prohibit alcohol and illegal drugs, you've been allowing prescription cannabis in your workplace all that time, as well as over-the-counter medications, prescriptions, those are all perfectly legal. So be mindful that your drug and alcohol policy should be comprehensive. Other things to keep in mind, and this is where I say, you know, reflect your workplace culture. If we say no alcohol or drugs are ever allowed on the premises, have you just prohibited the ability to deliver a wrapped, sealed gift to somebody when they retire, things you don't think about. Also thinking about your workplace when you define workplace and work premises. Um, have you defined that appropriately to include remote work or have you defined it in a way that is going to include remote work when you don't mean to? So creating those definitions are really, really important uh, from, a, from a policy standpoint. Also ensuring that you, you put in your policy some things that I would say might be obvious, but in my experience uh, doing occupational health and safety work in particular, you know, you kind of need to say be safe, be careful, you know, do all of these things, follow the policies. So parroting some of the things that are in the legislation that you think people would know, but maybe they don't. Things like you can't actually smoke or vape this stuff in public. So when your employee comes in and asks, well, why can't we just smoke it outside like we can smoke cigarettes? Well. 
because the law says we can't, but put those legal elements in your policy to remind your employees what is and isn't allowed. Don't expect them to just know the law and go with it. So that would be another sort of key point is parroting those things. Also, to the extent that you've determined what your rules will be and won't be for your workplace, make the consequences clear. What is going to be a breach of your policy? What are the rules and what are the consequences if you breach them? If you show up high, if you show up, um, you know, with cannabis in your pocket and you're not supposed to in this workplace and you get caught, what will be the consequences of your actions? And then finally, no policy is any good if your employees don't know about it. So you can write the best policy ever, and if you never train your employees and tell them what the rules are and what the consequences are, you've just killed a lot of trees. And it won't be enforceable if they don't know the rules and they don't know the consequences. So take the time, once you develop the policy, to do an awful lot of training on it uh, so people understand what they are. And then finally, we heard this morning, and I think I'll echo the comment, is there's a lot of things we don't know right now. So you're gonna have to draft these policies with what we do know. And if you start conservative and then build on that as rules change, as stigma changes, that's fine. The beauty of policy is you can change it. You can develop it over time and you can, you can make the change. If something isn't working, so then you fix it. You're not going to have to be rigidly bound by this policy and it can't ever change. So start with something conservative and then loosen it once you feel comfortable and we learn more. And that's okay. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Um, so we, we did talk this morning um, about <coughs> impairment in the workplace and people were making the statements of uh, you know, showing up fit for duty and how important that is. Uh, Jamie, if I could just uh, pick on you again for this one, um, you could perhaps bring a legal perspective that others haven't uh, brought to this uh, particular discussion yet. Um, tell us about dealing with a high employee. Okay, so somebody shows up in your workplace and they're behaving in a way that has you immediately concerned. So, first of all, my thing is, if somebody's impaired, regardless of what is causing the impairment, whether it's a drug, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sleep deprivation, I don't care. Um, it could be a medical emergency. Pull them off the line, okay? Take them aside, get them out of the job. Now, again, I'm dealing often with, with safety-sensitive environments, but again, if your receptionist is making interesting comments on the phone when she's answering them, you don't want her answering the phone anymore, get her out of that place and find out what's going on. Do an assessment to make sure it is indeed what you think it is, because you heard Joel say earlier uh, this morning, you know, it might walk like a duck and talk like a duck, but it's not always a duck. And what you think is somebody being high could be a medical emergency, and you need to get them assistance really quickly. So first and foremost, get them off the line and do the assessment and then engage in that conversation that might help you assess what's wrong and also if indeed they are in breach of one of your workplace rules. Following that, if you indeed believe that they are, are high, impaired, unfit for duty, and now you, they have indeed breached your policy because you have a wonderful policy that is, you know, set out the rules and you know that, you're going to want to do a bit of an investigation, determine exactly what rules were breached, and you may be in a situation where you have to discipline an employee or terminate their employment again, depending on what your policy provides. But first and foremost, be prepared and train your supervisors, your frontline folks, to be prepared to deal with those folks and have that conversation. Now, we've heard this this morning, this shouldn't be new. We could have had high employees show up in, at the workplace on the 16th of October and that doesn't change. The only difference might be that they were high on an illegal substance versus now a legal substance. How you would have dealt with that didn't change at midnight on the 17th of October. So if you were equipped to deal with it then, you're equipped to deal with it now. Thanks, Jamie, that's great. So going down the line here, uh, so Matt, you're, um, you're quite experienced uh, on the insurance carrier side of this. Uh, and, and with respect to medical cannabis, I just wanted you to please share with the audience here um, a little bit about how the coverage aspect of it works. Sure, thanks very much, Adam. Um, I think it's exciting that a private payer is actually uh, able to be represented up here and we're actually talking about providing uh, reimbursement access or, or coverage for medical cannabis products. Uh, it means we've come a long way. So uh, maybe a bit of his, a history on the coverage uh, for private payers. 
medical cannabis is not new. It's been around for several years, uh, but there really hasn't been a demand for private payers outside of a few excep exceptional circumstances uh, to to add this coverage for uh, for employers. It's employers who are making the decision, and uh, I think uh, there's a lot of unknowns. And really, the only reimbursement vehicle for uh, for plan members uh, uh, who are parts of these group benefit plans was a healthcare spending account because CRA. Uh, the Canadian uh, Revenue Agency, they, they deemed it as a medical expense, a legitimate medical expense. So there was a, an eligibility under healthcare spending accounts. And I think there's probably a lot of employers who don't even know that they're inadvertently offering a healthcare spending account that's covering medical cannabis. Um, the, the challenge with the historical uh, piece was that there was not a lot of people who were approved for uh, use of medical cannabis. So again, that pressure for employers and pressure for uh, for private payers, uh, subsequently, were not was not there uh, to to add the to, to to change the status quo. So what we've seen now is a huge increase in the number of of uh, Canadians who have legitimate access to medical cannabis, who still want to access it through the medical regime, that they're working with their physicians, and employers are uh, seeing increased pressure to provide an option. Uh, they're getting questions from their plan members, they're getting uh, from their employees, and and. So often they don't know where to turn. So uh, carriers have had to try to evolve their thinking uh, because in the old world with healthcare spending accounts, limits are notoriously low. You're you know, it's often $500 or $1,000 worth of a spending account. And the controls were really just to validate that, that it was a legitimate expense that you obtained it legally. Uh, there was no restriction on what you might be using it for as far as your medical condition. Uh, going forward, and I think we've seen an evolution over the last 12 months, and we'll, we'll still continue. We'll continue to see it going forward into 2019 and 2020. More and more uh, payers are, are coming up with a standardized option, whether it's under an extended healthcare benefit or or they're classifying it as a prescription drug benefit. And um, really, what we're seeing is an evolution in in, in that coverage. So. Um, there will be broader maximums, but you'll also see greater controls around prior authorization. So prior authorization is just making sure that a person seeks permission uh, and, and, and validates their eligibility for coverage before going to purchase or being covered for their, uh, for their, their product or their, their medicine in this case. Um, and there's going to be limits on which, uh, which conditions might be eligible. And it was very, very difficult, let me say, to, to come up with what those were. Uh, we've, I think a consistent theme is we haven't had a lot of information. There's a lot of unknowns. And carriers were in the same boat. Uh, the data is, 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 um, uh, is not as robust as we would typically expect with a drug type product. Uh, we were very used to dealing with you know, pharmacists being the gatekeepers, Health Canada being the approvers, and uh, allocating you know, medicinal products to very specific conditions with very specific dosage and strengths. And there was a lot of evidence in, 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 you know, in double-blinded trials and in, uh, in clinical trials but that the manufacturers of these products had to go through. So uh, carriers had to parse through a lot of data and this is why you're starting to see uh, a bit of a conservative approach where you're we're now uh, allowing coverage under uh, you know Great West starts January 1st other carriers have started already and we'll continue to see carriers uh, offering uh, coverage in the future uh, especially probably 2019 and 2020 to catch up to make sure that we're all doing uh, something but uh, but you can tell based on some of the disparity between the plan designs and the offerings that the carriers have come up with that we really had to do a lot of self-learning and we really based our plan designs on what employers were telling us what advisors and consultants were telling us that their employers were facing and the, and the type of coverage that they were looking for thanks Matt um, so I think there was a lot of kind of diligence that went into those decisions that were made by the insurance carriers, but I think, if I understand it correctly, uh, they did land on different approaches. So I just I w wouldn't mind your comments on what the impact is to employers of that difference in approaches. Sure. So um, you know, I mentioned that some carriers have decided to pay it under extended health care. Um, some have decided to pay it as a prescription drug benefit. Uh, you know, it, it aligns closely with the drug benefit, but you know, it's also could be considered sort of a medical supply if, if you want to view it that way. So there were different approaches administratively, uh, but there were also different approaches in carriers determining which conditions that they were going to cover. So you will not see a 100% consistency between a Great West Life, a Manulife, a Sun Life, or, or other smaller carriers. I uh, just wanted to uh, explore something here um, with respect to 
I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and, and there was a comment made by somebody quite senior um, at an insurance company where they were talking about, uh, geez, I'm really concerned about the quality actually of medical cannabis uh, because it doesn't follow the same regime as like a normal pharmaceutical product would. And so, John, um, you were kind of educating me on the amount of regulations that you have to ju jump through. Can you just share with the audience um, maybe a little bit about how you ensure quality and what you're required to do uh, from a medical standpoint? Yeah, ab absolutely. For the benefit of the audience uh, today, and, and just to walk us through the, uh, the the Health Canada requirements around production of medical cannabis it, it is really quite stringent. Um, Health Canada lays forth regulations uh, for uh, licensed producers to operate under, and these are requirements, everything from security to record keeping to good production practices compliance, and, and it's that good production practices, GPPs, uh, that are really the section of our regulations as it relates to product quality. Uh, now under that section, and it's, it's quite an overarching section, we would see uh, commentary from Health Canada on everything from facility design, making sure that facilities are designed in a way that they can uh, maintain sanitation and GPPs and essentially produce the product in an environment that would be medically appropriate. Uh, everything from there to uh, having an exhaustive sanitation program for every procedure uh, that, that you're undergoing, having standardized operating procedures so that when you're producing this product, Health Canada can be assured that if you're following SOPs, you are compliant uh, with good production practices. Uh, it kind of leads you all the way through the facility in terms of uh, everything that would ensure quality in a manner very similar to food production, uh, similar standards to what we would see at a maple leaf plant, uh, similar standards to what we would see at a pharmaceutical manufacturer to produce uh, narcotic drugs. Uh, so Health Canada has created a very similar framework uh, for licensed producers to operate under it. Beyond just how we operate our business, Health Canada under this GPP section also lays out requirements uh, for quality testing. Uh, and, and that is a set of uh, standardized testing that licensed producers have to follow for every single batch and lot of cannabis that we produce and sell. Uh, this lays out testing requirements for things like bacteria, uh, mold, mildew, uh, and some of the more harmful elements, so the human pathogens, again, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, uh, Listeria, uh, anything that could be very harmful uh, to a consumer, uh, and ensuring that any cannabis produced and sold for medical or recreational purposes is meeting these standards and is absent of those harmful elements. Uh, as well, we test for heavy metals, pesticides, uh, and the chemical composition of the, the plant from a potency standpoint, so the THC, uh, the psychoactive component and the CBD component. So from a production standpoint, we're very similar to any other drug manufacturer. Uh, from a quality testing standpoint, similar to any other drug manufacturer. I, I think some of the lingering concern here comes from that cannabis is not a prescription drug, uh, the same as any other drug in Canada. It does require a medical document, not a prescription, so this is very similar to a prescription, uh, but it is not exactly the same. Uh, and in many cases, or in most cases, cannabis is not falling under a provincial formulary. Uh, it's not necessarily eligible for the all-encompassing drug plans uh, that are offered to Canadians. But uh, as we've touched on here, we are seeing an increased uptake uh, and certainly a higher level of interest uh, from everyone around us. And I, I think this plays to my previous comments on that medical cannabis is certainly becoming more medical. Uh, we're seeing a shift in sentiment from healthcare practitioners uh, from pharmacists, from really the entire medical side of the industry, uh, and, and then that extends to insurance coverage uh, in terms of what is the discussion around coverage, where is it appropriate, what are coverage limits, etc. Thanks a lot, John. So, um, just with respect to cost, I think that might be a barrier that's, uh, you know, preventing some uh, employers from, from, uh, from jumping in there and, and including a, a medical cannabis offering. Uh, just wanted to get your thoughts on, on cost, John, because I think there might be some offsetting implications. Um, and also, just get your, your thoughts on the, the cost trend generally. Are we going to see costs go up, down, stay the same for the next few years? Uh, you know, I, I think this is going to be a, a similar level of commentary, just that it, it may be a little too early to draw any definitive conclusions, but I, I do have a little bit of information uh, for the audience today. Uh, our average prescription 
that, that we see at Delta 9. And this is, this is really the medical side of our business where we're working with doctors. Uh, we're intaking patients from all over the country. We service about 4,000 medical patients now across Canada. Uh, most of them based here in Manitoba, uh, or almost 50% of those here in Manitoba. Uh, so we are very Manitoba based, but we, we have a broad enough now sample set to be drawing some long run averages in terms of prescription size and things like that. Uh, our average prescription size is about one gram per day. Uh, so cannabis on these medical documents is often prescribed in terms of grams per day. And whether a patient is consuming the actual dried flour material or an ingestible oil or a gel cap, all of that relates to a grams per day equivalent uh, for these cannabis products. Uh, so our average prescription size, one gram a day. Now our average consumption in terms of what we see patients are actually purchasing uh, and consuming is about half of that, uh, about half a gram a day. Uh, now some of the issue around that becomes that the full gram a day prescription on average would run about $3,000 a year. Uh, the half gram, again, about half of that, about $1,500 a year. So it can be very expensive. And in many cases, 96% of cases right now for Delta 9, patients are paying out of pocket. Uh, now, some of those costs are eligible for reimbursement through someone's taxes at the end of the year. Uh, but again, in many cases, these are expensive prescriptions and patients are paying out of pocket. Uh, now, interestingly, and as we bring this into the, the scope of, uh, of, of group coverage, uh, what we're also seeing as well is that medical cannabis uh, is potentially replacing or supplementing treatment for other, uh, for other prescriptions that can, in many cases, be more costly. Uh, and the first survey that Delta 9 did on this uh, was in terms of harm prevention as it relates to opiates. We wanted to get a sense of, uh, for people who are using opiate-based drugs, uh, is there the potential for cannabis to be replacing that or to be decreasing the dosage? And we actually saw that 87% of our patients who were prescribed opiate drugs were able to decrease uh, their overall level of opiate intake, and about 34% of those were able to eliminate it entirely. Uh, so yes, uh, cannabis is an expensive drug right now. We are seeing some new formulations in terms of, uh, again, the ingestible oils, the gel caps, which will bring drug costs down. Uh, but the, the other nuance to this conversation is in many cases, we are not talking about simply adding a new drug to your plan. Uh, we're talking about the potential here for a patient using cannabis as a replacement uh, or, or again, to, to supplement, to augment uh, another treatment, which may decrease overall drug costs. But, uh, that's all the information I have. Again, I don't know that any definitive uh, uh, answers can be drawn yet, given it is very early still in the overall development of this, uh, this drug as a medical use drug in Canada. Thanks, John. So, Mark, finally over to you. Sorry, I left you hanging there for a little while. I've got a bit of a stiff neck. But... <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, first of all, Mark, thank you for making the trip from Toronto today to, to speak to us. We really appreciate that. Um, Shoppers Drug Mart is involved in all kinds of ways uh, when it comes to cannabis and uh, one of the ways that I think is most helpful for this audience is just around as an employer. You guys have had uh, coverage for medical cannabis in force for about a year and a half now. Uh, so what can you tell us? How's it gone? Yeah, well first of all thanks for having me uh, join the panel today. Pleasure to come out here. I did spend five years in, in Winnipeg doing pharmacy school so it's always nice to, to come back. Um, but yeah, really pleased to be able to share with you some of our experiences. So uh, the background to, to Shoppers Drug Mart as an employer paying for, for medical cannabis comes from the, the fact that we actually manage our own drug plan. So back in 2010, 2011, uh, we had some drug plan challenges as a large employer and decided to develop our own formulary to manage the cost of the drug plan. So we have our own clinic, cl uh, clinical committee and health economists, etc., that review drugs uh, for eligibility for coverage. We also manage our own prior authorization criteria. So when it came down, probably about three-ish years ago, as we were going through the normal review process of, of new drugs, et cetera, the topic of cannabis naturally came up within our uh, clinical advisory board. And we started to do some more research in, in the area to try to understand better which, what does the evidence look like. Um, and through that work, we came up with essentially three different levels of evidence. Uh, what we felt was the, the best level of evidence, kind of phase one, two, and three. Uh, we ended up, uh, to your point about a year and a half ago, adding uh, um, medical cannabis for three, er for three uh, uh, areas. One is for uh, nausea related to chemotherapy. The second is, uh, two of them are actually uh, multiple sclerosis related, one related to spasticity, um, and the other one related to neuropathic pain in multiple sclerosis. And so we started with that, knowing that you know, we, you're gonna be adding costs to a plan, we're a very large employer. 
So we, we did tiptoe in, into this uh, in a calculated way. Um, what we found so far is we've actually, and we had to set a budget in mind to understand as, a, you know, as an employer, as a, you think about adding benefits to the plan, you need to be m mindful of that. Uh, we have seen, I, I can't get into the specific numbers, but a much lower uh, rate of adoption than we would have expected. Um, which um, is interesting in terms of, you know, it, it does take time for new benefits to be used on, on plans, but it also uh, is because we're not making medical cannabis the primary uh, use for these specific indications. It's, you, typically, you got to try something first. Uh, so, so we're in the process right now of always reassessing our criteria, what we normally do, looking at other indications as well. So we're currently looking at a more broader neuropathic pain indication as well uh, for the organization. Um, the, uh, from, a, from a policies perspective, we did, uh, in parallel to that clinical work, did, did a bunch of work on, on the policy side, whether it was fit for duty, alcohol and drug policy, smoking policy, etc. What we found was for our organization, we had, you know, policies in place. Did they have to be you know, tinkered? And uh, uh, yes, they absolutely did. It didn't turn out for our organization to be a, a major uh, it's called a wholesale renovation of the policies. It was more, much more modest in nature, more tinkering around the edges, but to the point that's been made, you really need to go through it because it, 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 to cover your risks and make sure you're doing the right thing for your employee uh, overall health and for your customers actually as well. So that's really what, from, the, uh, from what has been our experience. It's been very positive. Again, not used as much as uh, the organization had thought, and we're looking at seeing what we can do to broaden access. Thank you. That's great, Mark. So. Uh, Jamie, I just wanted to uh, skip over to you. Um, I was at a conference. Um, they were talking a little bit about a Mercer survey that was recently done. Uh, you know, what are employers concerned about when it comes to cannabis? And I was kind of surprised. One of the top concerns was that they were going to be inundated with requests for accommodation around uh, cannabis. And uh, I was just hoping if you could enlighten us and, and help me understand uh, why employers would be concerned, do they have to be concerned, and what is that all about? Okay, so when we're talking about accommodation, we're looking at the human rights issues in terms of the, the duty to accommodate an employee who may have a disability, um, and with because of that disability may be using medicinal cannabis, or we're looking at accommodating somebody who has an addiction, addiction being a disability under the human rights, recognized under the human rights code that requires some accommodation. So there's two areas where we might see accommodation come up. Recognizing, of course, we've had addiction for a very long time. So we, we heard about addictions this morning in terms of whether you, you, you can be addicted to cannabis, but that didn't change with legalization. So you're dealing with that the same way you would any other addiction that presents in your workplace as, as far as, as alcohol or whatever is, is concerned. So I, what I'm hearing though is probably it's more about the accommodation for the medicinal use piece. And keeping in mind that we've had the ability to have medicinal cannabis for, for a long time. Uh, that, that's not a new thing and employers have been having to, to face that accommodation for, for quite a while. So the fact that suddenly we have uh, recreational cannabis legalized shouldn't really change the, the medicinal accommodation regime because again we've been dealing with that for a while. What the concern I think is is perhaps twofold is people who are going to now sort of we're going to start self-medicating and making those own choices for themselves rather than going to a medical practitioner and, and finding out if this is really the, the best drug for them and, and then you know, having some of the controls in place about understanding how much they should take, what's the effect going to be on them, and then how do you in turn as an employer take the information that you would need in that accommodation discussion when somebody comes forward and says, well, I, I require a workplace accommodation, I'm taking this drug that might have an impairing effect on my workplace and I need you to accommodate me. And then you have a bunch of questions that say, well, you know, you have a duty to assist in your search for accommodation, I need to know all of these things, and they don't have those answers because they're self-medicating. The answer to that is, well, then, go send them to a medical practitioner and get those answers, and the Human Rights Commission says you can do that. The Human Rights Commission has actually issued some pretty good guidance uh, that coincided with uh, the legalization date to explain that indeed, first of all, accommodation arises only when it is because of a medical need. You're accommodating the disability, you're not accommodating the choice of, of drug to treat that disability. And that goes for, again, any type of, of medicine or drug that somebody might be taking for whatever their condition is. So the fact that somebody might have MS, glaucoma, some, some form of, of disability, that's what you're accommodating. And 
whether or not cannabis can be accommodated within that is something you'll have to explore the same way you would explore any accommodation that you've already had to explore in your workplace. The key component to remember when it comes to accommodation is just because somebody has a medical need doesn't give somebody a right to be impaired at work. So if somebody's seeking an accommodation and there are concerns around impairment, whether that's from medicinal cannabis or any other drug that they might be taking for their, for their illness or their disability, that doesn't mean they get to just suddenly you know, smoke up whenever they want or come to work impaired. Absolutely not. You can put rules and parameters around that and then even you know, depending on your workplace and how safety sensitive it is or the role that somebody plays, sometimes the answer is we can't accommodate you. You just have to show your work. So that would be the other key when it comes to accommodation is, um, you know, if you, if you get a request for accommodation and you might get to know we can't, don't jump to conclusions. Show that you've actually gone through the process of asking some questions, getting some information, getting educated on whether in fact you can do this. And if your answer is going to be no, be prepared to be able to demonstrate that if somebody does make a human rights complaint and suggests you should have accommodated when you in fact didn't. Jumping to conclusions is perhaps the biggest mistake I see people make when it comes to particularly medicinal cannabis for all the reasons we've already talked about this morning, is there's so many unknowns, it's so easy for people to jump to those conclusions about what the drug may or may not do. Uh, they don't understand the difference between THC and CBD and, and that, that there can be medicinal effects as opposed to just the effect that makes somebody high. And that leads people to just say, well, no, I don't care if you have a medicinal need and that's not how accommodation works. But, we could go back to those cardinal rules of human rights law. If somebody's seeking an accommodation, they have to bring forward the information. They have to have an underlying disability or something that's recognized under the human rights code to trigger that. They have an obligation to participate in their search for accommodation, which means they can't just say, I have this and now you do it. They will have to give you some information and then it's meant to be a multi-party process to do some back and forth to see if you can accommodate. And then again, that final rule is if you get to know, um, be prepared to show your work. <laughs> That's great, thank you, Jamie. So Mark, uh, I just wanted to um, draw on your experience as a pharmacist for a second, uh, because I've heard you speak a number of times on the role that pharmacists can play. And so I just wanted to, um, for the benefit of the room, uh, when it comes to cannabis, uh, what can or should the role of a pharmacist be? Yeah, so, so thanks, Adam. So. Um, you know, every day, whether it's our stores or other pharmacies across Canada, patients are, co are coming in asking their pharmacists about qu questions about this because they're on medications and they're asking questions about what are the interactions, what are the side effects, etc. Um, you know, our perspective would be that pharmacists are the experts in medication management and, and it, you know, they have a major role to play in the safe use education of, of Canadians uh, on medical cannabis. and. And as such, you know, our, our position would be that it makes sense for, for, uh, for can medical cannabis to be available through pharmacies. So right. I think it's pretty, from our perspective, pretty, right, simple. pretty short. Um, when we're out talking to you know, other stakeholders in the industry, there tends to be a lot of interest in that same uh, position. Um, and so we'll see what the future holds. Thank you. So. Um, in your role as the, uh, the Vice President of Employer Solutions with Shoppers, um, you're often selling to employers, and so I wanted to get a sense from you in terms of the different offerings that employers can take advantage of, if you will. Yeah, so just to clarify a small thing. So I, yeah, I lead the Employer Health Solutions Group. Um, we look to, to create new value and really focus on, on uh, identifying and closing healthcare gaps in Canada from an employer perspective. We do that in partnerships with um, insurance companies, advisors, consultants, et cetera. So we don't have a full team going out selling to, to, to employers. Um, that said, I can tell you about the gaps that we've seen and what things that we think there are opportunities for us and others. So, so one is with, with respect to um, you know, uh, managing, the, you know, finding the right strain for, for a patient. And so, what we what we hear from the marketplace is, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the way a prescription is prescribed by a physician is not the way they, they are for, for core medications. So it's not naming the it's, it's often not naming the, the the product or the strain or etc. So it's really you know a gram a day for 30, 30 days or thirty grams or something, and then the patient you know has to kind of in, in many cases navigate. So 
it, that's not all, always the case, but there is a navigation uh, um, challenge in, in the marketplace that we've identified. So we think there's an opportunity for, uh, for us and others to, to help patients um, identify and, and find the right strain, give them some counseling around what, based on what, what conditions they have, when their symptoms are, uh, you know, and, and the type of other medications they're on to help them find an appropriate strain to manage their, manage their health and, and optimize their health outcomes. So there's a, there's a strain piece. Um, and I think as well, uh, the regulations may have changed on this, but there is a, a challenge in some cases with one medical document being with one LP only and how to make sure if someone, if a patient needs multiple products from different LPs, how, how does that, how do they navigate that? So really it's about, really navigation in the system is an area that we think we can create some value for and it's something that we're, we're actively thinking about. Thanks, Mark. So, uh, John, I want to go back to you just for a second. Um, there was an article in the Globe and Mail on November 13th that was talking about uh, shortages and, uh, you know, certain companies uh, are going to be taking quite a while to even rectify the, the situation that they're in with their inventory. Tell us a little bit about uh, Delta 9's experience with uh, how you're managing that situation. Uh, yeah, so product shortages, I mean, we've all seen the, the news stories, whether this was in advance of legalization, uh, postulating that the supply shortages could uh, be a very real scenario for us or now since legalization where we have seen the reality uh, and that is there there have certainly been supply shortages across the industry uh, I guess just to, to point out that Delta 9 store has not run out of, of cannabis products at any point there so uh, there are certainly stores across the country that have done a, a better job in terms of product procurement uh, that have supply backing perhaps from a vertically integrated uh, uh, producer supplier network uh, and, and have done a little bit better job in terms of supply. Uh, speaking to Delta 9 specifically, uh, we made decisions at, at the corporate level that we would allocate supply to our medical cannabis patients, uh, kind of standalone of, of what we see then going into the, uh, the, the recreational uh, supply chain. Uh, so, you know, certainly wanted to ensure that, you know, there are patients who, who have their medical documents with us, they're, they're dependent on us for their supply of medical cannabis products. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, that that pipeline continued to be full uh, for, for medical patients. So, uh, you know, we, we've seen stories as well around patients who are not able to access their medical cannabis products, and obviously that's, uh, I, I think, from my end, the highest level of concern uh, in the supply shortage uh, scenario. Uh, what we've seen on the recreational side is that because every province has a, a differing take around distribution and, and we see you know Ontario British Columbia with really just uh, online options uh, for for recreational consumers we see uh, Manitoba Saskatchewan Alberta with more of a privatized framework that's a little bit more competitive from a, a, a producer distributor and a retailer standpoint um, you know, I, I think we're now starting to see the, the differences in terms of the framework for decisions that different provinces have made and how that directly impacts uh, product supply in, in the supply shortage environment. Uh, what's important to consider in terms of supply shortages is these are, are regional, they're product specific, they're cyclical, they're uh, not necessarily every product on a store shelf, uh, but it, it is certainly impacting the industry. Uh, at the same time, we see consumer use surveys that over 60% uh, recreational cannabis consumers who were surveyed have switched over to the legal market. Uh, so I, I think we've seen, you know, for the first month here of, of legalization, quite a success in terms of moving consumers over from the black market to, uh, to the legal market. Uh, now obviously there's some work left to do to fill store shelves and to really fill this product pipeline. Uh, I think the producers in aggregate across the Health Canada regulated industry are, are all working together to ramp up supply uh, of course, this is an agricultural product at heart, so this does take some time uh, to, to ramp up the production capacity to actually have those seeds in the ground uh, and, and have that product flush itself out. Uh, so all of this will take time. Uh, the, the overall industry consensus is this is going to take between a year and two years uh, for the supply-demand equilibrium to be met, uh, for producers in aggregate to ramp up supply to meet demand. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it's likely that we will see again certain pockets or regions or products or producers uh, that are running out of product. Uh, so that, that uh, may flesh out a little bit more detail for us in the overall supply picture. Thanks, John. So uh, our last question before we go to uh, individual wrap-ups from each person. Um, so 
We heard a little bit earlier about uh, some employers' approach to this where they've banned it altogether. You know, if you're an employee, you can never take this, uh, even though it's legal. Um, you know, the Calgary Police.